Praise the Lord, everybody. God bless you this morning. This is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Thank God for all of you that are watching out there today. I pray that the Lord has been blessing you all week long and that you are reaping the harvest that God has promised you and that you are taking back everything that the devil stole from you. I am on fire this week, you all. I have been imparted into and some things spoken into my life um, last week. And I just feel like running on for the Lord. I'm telling you, I am excited. Um, last Thursday, I had the privilege to be at uh, Bishop Dan Sedgwick Daniels Church, who was a general board member of the Church of God in Christ, and Pastor Jamal Bryant. What an awesome word that he brought on Thursday night. That was confirmation on so many levels for myself and my church. So I'm just excited for what the Lord is doing and for the people that he's bringing into my life and the powerful and awesome men of God that he is connecting me to. And I pray that God connects you with people that will help you go and grow into your next level. It is so in Jesus name. Now, today we're talking about the river of life. Amen. The river of life. We're staying in the book of Revelation where the angels are giving John revelation as far as what it's going to be like when God completely redo, re, redoes what he did before. Amen. Talking about how when we when we dwell with God, how it's going to once again mirror what it was in Eden, how we'll once again be living in that bliss that Adam and Eve were living in when they were in Eden. So our scriptures are coming from Revelation 22, chapter 22, verses one through seven. Pretty short lesson, not going to hold you too long today. Amen. But we're going to start reading um, in chapter 22. But before we do that, let's go to the throne of grace and pray, and then we'll get right on into our lesson. Lord, we thank you for another day, God, that you have blessed us, that you have kept us, God that you have kept us safe. Lord, we say thank you for every little thing that you've done. And God, we are expecting for you to move in a mighty way in each and every one of our lives. God, give us what it takes. Give us the wisdom that it takes to be the best version of ourselves that is pleasing unto you. We know you're able and we know you can. In the mighty and matchless name of Jesus, we pray. And everyone said together, amen. Amen. The river, the river of life. That's what we're going to be talking about today. We're talking about that great river. Uh, Revelation 22, it really portrays and visions and images the wonderful future that awaits us when we come into the knowledge of God's and God's people will get a completely different view of things that they never thought that they would be able to see before. But you can't see those things in the flesh that we're in right now. There's a new body that awaits each and every one of us that is capable of allowing us to be able to behold the glory of the Lord. Because in these bodies, we can't we can't behold God's glory because he's too, he, he's just too God. He's, he's just too pure. He's, he's too powerful. He's too bright. Amen. For us to even be able to behold his glory. Notice that even if you, if it's a bright sunny day, you go out and you look at the sun, you cannot look directly into the sun because it's just too bright. Even though it's as far off as it could possibly be, even though it's so many millions of miles away from the earth, yet you cannot look at the sun unless it makes your eyes get all fuzzy and blurry and possibly blind you. So if the sun can do that, you know that you can't behold the glory of God in this body. Amen. But the new bodies that we have will be able to behold his glory. So let's read chapter 22 and we're going to read the first two verses and then we'll expound. Then the angel showed me a river with the water of light, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It flowed down the center of the main street, and on each side of the river grew a tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit with a fresh crop each month. The leaves were used for medicine to heal the nation. So this new heaven and this new earth is a place as we read right here, of perfect abundance. It's a world fit for God and his people to reign. 
He's literally created a place that he and his people can dwell harmoniously together. And this is true, the redeemed urban living. To paint a picture of the greatest possible abundance and blessing, John's vision returns to the place God's, of God's original purpose. And what was that? His original purpose and plan was the Garden of Eden. So now he's giving John a vision of how we're going to go back to that same place. Takes us back to God's original purpose. Then there was a life-giving river that flows in the new Jerusalem. This water symbolizes an everlasting life given by Jesus through what? The spirit. So that river that John is referring to that flows from the throne is a river that represents everlasting life. When we return to our creator, to our maker, we won't have to worry about dying or death or being separated from the new body like we do today, being separated from this physical body. But when we are with him, there will be no more separation. It will be everlasting and eternal life, an abundant life, just as he promised in John 10.10. 10. He promises to give us abundant. You think that you live in abundantly now? You think that you got it all together now? You think that everything is on and popping now? Wait until you get to the place that God has prepared for you and I. You have not seen, you have not lived all the things that God has in store for you. So just as the tree of life, as we understand and we read in these scriptures, just as the tree of life stood in Eden, guess what? It will also stand in the new Jerusalem amidst the river, represented by 12 trees, a number symbolizing what? Divine completeness and government. Whenever you see that number 12 in the Bible, something is about to be divinely completed. It, it represents divine government, meaning that we will not have to worry about President Trump in the next life. We won't have to worry about President Biden in the next life or any other governments or any other people that you can name. You won't have to worry about being under their rule, but we will be under the theocracy of God himself. And I'm glad about it because God is no respecter of person. He allows it to rain on the just and the unjust. I'm glad that when we serve under God in the new heaven, in the new earth, that there will be no dying, no pain, no lying, no hate, no backbiting, but it will be literally every single day, you and I singing holy, holy to the most high God without getting tired, without getting bored, without complaining, but doing it with joy. What a day. So here, we see that God is talking about the leaves that are on the tree because see, God has a purpose for literally everything. So even the leaves, as the scripture we just read, will do what? They will provide healing. They will provide medicine to bind up all wounds, especially sin and spiritual brokenness. Mm. And God will wash away every single thing every dirty thing, every muddy thing, every murky thing that has been in your life, that has clouded your judgment, that has separated you from him, God will wash it all away and you and I will be made new. You will be made whole. That's enough to thank God for. Why? Because we know that God brings about this purpose, redeeming not only his chosen remnant, but he also is going to redeem the earth itself. That's why the Bible says when John described what he saw in the vision, he said, I saw a new heaven and he said, I saw a new earth. God is going to do this thing over again and this time. There won't be any mess ups. This time, there won't be any temptation to throw you off. But it'll be a perfect, sufficient, and abundant place for each and every one of us to dwell in. So let's read more about God's presence. Let's read verses three through five. 
No longer will there be a curse upon anything. For the throne of God and the lamb will be there and his servants will worship him and they will see his face and his name will be written on their foreheads. And there will be no night, no need for lamps or sun for the Lord God will shine on them and they will reign forever and ever. So what we read here, all of this is showing us that Edenic, in other words, Eden, that Edenic abundance is possible because like Eden, the new Jerusalem will no longer be under or suffering from a curse. Everything in this new Jerusalem will be pure. Everything in this new Jerusalem will be tailor-made for what you and I need in order to get along with our God. Everything will be new never rusting, never getting old, never wearing out. The curse has been canceled out by the very presence of God, because guess what? Curses, sickness, disease cannot stand in the presence of God. So wherever God is, sin cannot be. Curses cannot be. Only thing that can be there is what God himself embodies. So in the new city, God now dwells in perfect purity with a pure people, just like in the beginning. God walked with Adam and Eve. He had conversation with them. He dwelled with them until they ate the fruit. But this time, when God rearranges things, when he does this thing all anew, we will be pure. And because we are pure, we can stand to be in the presence of a pure God. Right now, we can't stand in God's physical presence because we're not pure enough. I know you saved. I know you anointed. I know you blessed and highly favored. But even on your best day, you are still not equipped or qualified to right now in your current state of being, be a, being able to stand in God's presence. So here it is. Even as God exists in loving fellowship with himself in three persons, so now all his people will be enfolded in that perfect trust, in that perfect love and communion. It's going to be a perfect triune of love. Not only will we feel it, we won't, not only do the, does the Holy Spirit and Jesus the Christ feel that love right now, that unconditional, indescribable, pure love, but we will partake in that triumph of pure love. Right now, if God were to pour all of that love on us, we wouldn't be able to have, you don't even know what to do with all the love that God will pour into you. Right now in this body, you couldn't even handle all of the love that God has for all of us. So he claims us, as we read, as his own with our name, with his name on our foreheads. Even though throughout the scripture, seeing the face of God has been a frightening thing. Now we are pure enough to meet his gaze, which illuminates heaven. Mm. As I said before. Once we are in our new bodies, once we have transitioned out of this flesh into our heavenly body that doesn't get tired, doesn't suffer from cancer or, or, or get, you know, any kind of disease, then we will be pure enough to stand before God and be able to behold, to look, to stand in his glory. Because the pureness of the new body that he's made. And there will be no need for sun. There will be no need for light bulbs or electricity or light. Why? Because being in the very presence of God is light. It will literally illuminate everything that is surrounding it. God's presence is so tough. Ooh, y'all hear me. 
that there is no as big and as great as our sun is and as essential as the sun as we need the sun to warm the earth and for things to grow when god creates the new heaven and new earth and the new jerusalem comes down the sun will be irrelevant the sun will be obsolete there will be no need for a sun because god's presence his light will light up the whole entire universe and he doesn't even have to try. You don't have to worry about what time is it? Is darkness coming soon? I'm a, I'm a, I'm a morning person. I don't know about anybody else, but I love the summertime. I don't know if it was because I was born in the summer or whatever the case is, but I love the summer because the days are longer and the nights are shorter. It gets brighter earlier and it stays brighter later than in the wintertime. I love being able to bask in the sun. When wintertime comes, I'm a whole different person because it's not enough light. Light doesn't last long enough for me in the wintertime. But thank God, every day when we dwell with God in this new place, ah, thank you. Every day, there will be, well, not only will it be like Sunday, but every single day, you won't have to worry about night. You won't have to worry about the sunset. You won't have to worry about when is the sun going to rise because it will always be illuminated because we'll forever be in the presence of our God. So let's, let's close this thing out and read verses six through seven. Here's what it says. Then the angel said to me, everything you have heard and seen is trustworthy and true. God will never lie to you. The Lord God who inspires his prophets has sent his angel to tell his servants that will happen soon. Look, I am coming soon. Blessed are those who obey the words of the prophecy written in this book. So we see that God in his mercy frequently gives added testimony to certainty of what he reveals. He said, listen to the prophets. Everything that I've given John to write down is absolutely true. Prepare yourselves now. Get your house in order now. Make things right with the people that you had problems with now. Because God said, I am coming soon. Subscribe to you everything that you will behold when I come. He said, don't take John's words lightly. Don't take the man of God or the woman of God who reads this very passage of scripture lightly. Don't think that this is some fairy tale. God said, no, this is really going to happen. I am really coming soon. I am really going to establish a new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem. And there will be a river that flows from my throne throughout the whole entire region, throughout the whole entire world, there is a river which represents my everlasting love, which represents abundance more than enough, which represents peace. Everything that we have to fight and grit for right now in this flesh, in this world, God said it will be readily made available to you without struggle, without strife. Mm. God said it'll be there in abundance. Say no fairy tale. Say no Dr. Seuss book. But this is the revelatory word of God. And if God said it, it's going to happen. So God of the holy prophets, the Lord, so here it is, to call the Lord the God of the holy prophets is to show that these words, just like the prophet's words, are breathed out of God. And since they are breathed out of God, they cannot be false. Just as the prophets were able to say, thus saith the Lord, so also the angel with the same authority promises that everything that he said, every word is faithful and it is true and that these things must shortly be done. Likewise, when John is commanded not to seal up the prophecy, but he was commanded to write it down, God shows us that the vision is true. He said, John, I just don't want you to see it, because, but I need you to write it down because you're not going to be here always. 
your time is drawing near. He said, but if you write it down, write down everything that you see, somebody is going to find your notebook. He's of it. They're going to show other folk. They're going to give what I've given you to other people so that others know what is to come. Because if John only saw the vision but didn't record it, it would have died with him. The vision would have died when he died. And none of us, I wouldn't have anything to teach in Sunday school today. Why? Because John didn't write it down. But because he wrote it down, I can tell you, you can read it for yourself. It's shown that God is going to create a new heaven and a new earth. He's going to establish himself with his people once again and redo what Adam and Eve had undone. And this time it cannot be undone. That's enough to be excited about. We don't have to be scared or fear the coming of the Lord, but we should be waiting with expectation that when he comes, it's going to be all good. It's going to be all good. That's why he commanded John. Don't seal up. Don't seal up the prophecy. Don't hide it. Don't keep it to yourself, but write it down to inspire others. And one thing that we got to understand, and then I'm closing, is that the promise is also given with a specific urgency. Christ promises to come quickly, signaling the believer that the words of this book should not only be read, but they should be immediately obeyed. God said, as soon as you read it, start getting your stuff together. When you read this word, God said, you are now held accountable. Now I'm looking at you in a different light because now you know better. You know what my word says. You know what I've commanded you. He said, so whatever you read, immediately obey it because you don't know when I'm coming, but I'm telling you I'm coming soon. You don't know what my soon is because I operate outside of the time that you're governed by. So when you read it, get ready. Start preparing yourself so that you don't miss all of the beauty and splendor that I have waiting for you. So this admonishes all believers to expect Christ's return and glorious fulfillment of God's promises. Whatever he said in the scripture, whatever promise that was made, God is going to see it through. He is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he shall repent. Whatever God says, you can take it to the bank and cash it. Because his word is true. Don't you want to be there? Don't you want to go there? Don't you want to meet God face to face? Don't you want to be able to stand in the holy place and gaze upon his glory as he sits upon his throne in all power and glory and majesty? Well, if your answer is yes, then I challenge you to get ready. I challenge you to prepare yourself. Get in God's word. Develop relationship with him now. Because when he comes, it's too late. He's coming for those who were already in relationship with him. He's coming for a church without spot or blemish. Get ready and we'll all be there together. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. God, thank you for speaking through me that I might speak to your people about what is to come. God, thank you for revealing your word to John on the island that he was secluded on. God, we thank you that he had enough in him to write down what he saw write down what he heard and he didn't just seal it up and let it die with him. But God, he left us a blueprint. He left us a model of what the new heaven and new earth will look like so that we can look forward to something when we separate from this body. So spirit of the living God, we ask that you would fall fresh on us today. Give us your divine favor. Continue to keep us in your jealous care until the day we meet again. And it is in your master's name we pray. 
And everybody said together, amen. Facebook, YouTube, Harvest of Faith, online, offline, in person, wherever you are, whoever you are. We love you. And we pray, I pray, that you reap the harvest that God promised you and take back everything that the devil stole. And we'll see you next week if it be the will of the Lord. God bless you and God keep you is always our prayer. Amen.